there, everyone. Happy December 9th. How exciting. It's December, great things are happening, and I am interviewing a legend today. Legendary, even before stand-up paddling came along. Um, you know this waterman in probably a lot of different ways. You probably knew about him before stand-up paddling came along because he's a legendary surfer. Waterman, by every definition, and I know sometimes, like he's in Hawaii, uh, they're very specific about what it means to be a waterman. Well, I can't think of any definition that wouldn't include someone who has been a champion windsurfer and outrigger and really was there at the very, very beginning of um, our sport, which is so exciting. So I am speaking of the legendary Dave Kalama. He uh, lives in Kula Maui and has been, um, I think most of us think of him as Hawaiian, but I know he has some Cali roots, mammoth and somewhere in the OC. Um, which is where I am, so I'd love to claim that. He's been um, a board shaper and designer and innovator in so many ways in so many parts of stand-up paddling. I think a lot of you probably think of, of him as a um, big wave subsurfer, uh, but again, his um, if you haven't met him before, just the nicest guy and so open to everything. I think he would ride any kind of wave. It's all about the fun. So um, I'm going to see if he, he found us. Yay. Can't wait to chat with Dave. Um, it's going to be hard to fit it all in because they know he has lots of stories to tell. Dave is a man. <laughs> That's Chris Parker saying that right now. How are you doing? Can you hear me? Am I on? I can hear you and you're oh, on. Okay. <laughs> it's really easy, I promise. I'm sorry there's a little misunderstanding, but you found it. Yes. <laughs> he I'll was waiting for a Zoom time. link. <laughs> You are here, and um, I don't know if you heard your little introduction, but um, just talking about you, so many people who are here probably knew you well before stand-up paddling, but you've been such a huge part of stand-up paddling on so many levels. And as Chris Parker has said right here, Sup Racer, he's the man. Yeah, so much to talk about. You know, you have water roots. Your last name is Kalama. Um, is, is your roof leaking? I know you're having a lot of uh, gnarly weather there. <laughs> no, it's... it's one of the few things that uh, is doing okay, uh, the roads, Wi-Fi only came on late last night, which means it was out for almost three days. Wow. Um, there were some road blockages. It was, in some areas, very serious, but in my specific part of the neighborhood, not too bad. Well, it is very serious, and I'm sorry you've had that gnarly weather. I know you were out of country and came into it. Um, Glad you're safe and hopefully everybody else is. But I have to say one good thing about that is there isn't great weather and great waves out there. Well, there might be great waves, but I actually have you here in the middle of the day because <laughs> I know outdoors calls your name all the time to get out there and it would be hard if something really good was happening out there. <laughs> yeah, it look, it's looking pretty windy today. So there's a chance I might get a downwinder later today. Well, there you go. But, so again, uh, a waterman on every level, and you were champion windsurfer, and you did outrigger, and you were already a surfer, and big waves, and an innovator well before stand-up came along. But you were there at the very beginning um, as Laird Hamilton's tow-in partner. And um, where did you first see stand-up? Or I mean, you you guys are credited sort of with starting it. You know, there's of course well, discussion. We, I don't know how you feel about how it started, but <laughs> we did not invent it. Um, you know, if I had to give credit to somebody, it'd probably be Duke. I've heard stories that Duke was the originator, and uh, the gentleman's name from Kentucky who saw the Duke do it and really kind of fell in love with it and, and really took it on as his primary form of surfing. Um, God, I, I can't remember the name right now. Is it that older guy that they did a documentary on? Yes. I'm not around anymore, but yeah. Exactly. Um, oh, that's horrible. I can't remember either, but I, I know, know you're I'm ready. ashamed I can't remember. But in any case, so he's the first one that I know of that really made it his thing. Um, lots of other people in Hawaii, Waikiki, Makaha have done it. But uh, Laird and I sort of discovered it together. And then through Laird's popularity and exposure that he gets when he's in California, um, shared it with a lot of people as well as I did here in Hawaii, but that didn't garnish as much exposure. And uh, yeah, with all the people doing it in California, kind of 
caught wildfire and, and really took off. And uh, so you could say we popularized it, but no, we didn't invent it or, or create it. So um, I didn't mention the word humble, but you already heard that from him. He's always, you know, elevating other people, Dave Kalama. <laughs> you had way more to do with it than you think, and you have so been a part of this the whole time and maintained it. And I think your um, kind of aloha and humbleness and stuff is, is so, so great for our sport. So what did your first paddle, what the board look like? Was it a, I know tandem surfboards were one of the things people used. Did you have to do a makeshift paddle if there weren't paddles around? Well, my very first um, interaction with stand up, I guess you'd say, is about 95-ish, 96, something like that. And Laird and I were both sponsored by a company called Oxbow, a clothing company out of France. And at that time, we rode 12-foot longboards quite regularly during the summertime. And on the south shore of Maui, a lot of times the wind blows offshore real strong. So we'd kick out of a wave, and then we'd just stand there and let the wind blow us back out to the lineup. So on this given day, we were doing that, trying to get pictures, and it was taking too long to get back out. And I had some canoe paddles in my truck from, from uh, doing a one-man run. So I thought, well, you know what, let's grab the paddles. We can get back out quicker and, and be more productive. So I grabbed the paddles, tossed one to Laird. I've got one because of the canoe paddles. They're we're way bent over, right, to try and get the paddles to the water. And we're laughing, and we're getting out much quicker, and we're having fun. And uh, honestly, at the, at the end of the session, I didn't think too much of it. And Laird, I mean, we both had a ball. But the next day, Laird went and had paddles made for us that were much longer ah. and so we didn't have to bend over as much and and that kind of was the tipping point that made it much more functional um and got us really going and doing it on a regular basis so you gave laird his first paddle really <laughs> that little canoe about yeah. that oc1 you can paddle. say that you can say that <laughs> wow but that's i mean that you guys had like a vision early for it like oh this kind of works like this is this is cool this is fun as you said um but that he would go out the next day and already like okay i'm i'm making i'm improving on this is is legendary so thank you um more than anything for for seeing that for finding that and that's not the only thing you've had a vision for along the way but um Wow, kind of wild to watch what happened since 95. And for most of us, it's been more like since 2005 to 2010. So you were um, in maybe 10 years earlier than most, I would say. Um, but already a waterman. So talk about just like your family. Kalama is a big name in Hawaii and um, in Outrigger, the wind. Maui is such a hub for all sports to do with all things, paddling and surfing and wind. And you do them all. Yeah, so to see if I can nail all your questions down and get them uh, in the right order. So the history is my father, Elima, was 1962 U.S. surfing champion. Um, so I do have some roots there in surfing. And his father, Noah, was the first one to start an outrigger canoe club in California. And wow. was one of the top two or three body surfers for quite some time uh, in Hawaii and used to swim competitively against the Duke. But obviously, uh, Duke being Duke, not many people beat him, obviously. So, uh, but yeah, a lot, lot of connections to the water throughout Hawaii. Um, I've been on Maui now for 36 years, just over 36 years. And the wind as you noted, is a very big part of Maui's existence. Um, mm -hmm. If you only surf here, you're going to be a bit frustrated. So it's good to have a water sport to kind of fall back on or become your primary uh, means to getting in the water. And so windsurfing was a big part of my life for several years. Um, then I got into paddle boarding with Laird and, and Jerry Lopez kind of introduced me to that. And so I learned about downwinding and then not too long after is when we kind of got into stand up and our first stand up downwinds were on our wave boards and didn't take us too long to figure out that we could do better than a longboard for downwinding. And so that set us off on a course of trying to figure out um, what the fastest 
down downwind boards might look like for stand up, uh, which was quite fun to kind of crack the code on that. Spent a lot of time and money figuring that out. <laughs> but uh, and now the latest iteration of my downwinding, um, along with a lot of one man canoe and two man canoe and six man canoe, along that whole period is uh, now it's foiling for downwinding. Absolutely. And so that's probably my primary. Um, kind of discipline for the time being uh, in relation to the wind and Maui and all that stuff. So really and, enjoying it. Yeah, which is fantastic. I, I mean, the smile on your face and the picture that we used in so many pictures um, is so telling of, of that you enjoy this, you know, being one of the first and being always those er an early adopter of whatever it is and often leading the way but also that, that it's because it's fun. <laughs> and that's such a big part of it. I'm going to keep saying that word. You talked about your generations. I didn't know that about your grandpa and way back. Which, which club was it in California that he started? Newport yeah, Outrigger. Ah, that's so cool. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And as we talk about generations and foiling, your son, Austin, is pretty darn good, isn't he? And that's a father-son thing that you guys do. Really cool. Yeah, he's killing it. He's kind of a freak on the foil. Um, you know, there was, there was a hot second. I used to be able to say I was better than him, but that lasted about two minutes and <laughs> he just destroys it. Um, you know, I, I don't say that too lightly. Obviously I'm biased because he's my son, but, uh, he seems to have a real knack for figuring out how to ride the foil in really unconventional ways. So it's pretty cool to watch that and have a front seat to the evolution of, of high performance foiling. Um, and he's going into big waves and charging really hard and, and kind of making a name for himself in that category. So uh, yeah, it's, it's really fun to kind of vicariously relive my big wave days through him now and um, understand what he's going through and what it means to be doing what he's doing. Well, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. <laughs> I want to go back to um, paddle boarding just because I think it's kind of a shame that paddle boarding has, we didn't do it on purpose, but stand up has kind of taken over that word. And a lot of times when they talk about paddle boarding, they mean stand up. But paddle mm -hmm. boarding was already a discipline. It has a long history. It is traditional or prone, but you're supposed to just call it paddle boarding. So did yep. you actually do crossings? I didn't know that was one of your many sports. I should have guessed because you do it all, but. Yeah, through, through I think it'd be like the real late 80s or 90 um, into the latter 90s, I did several Molokai crossings on a paddleboard. Wow. Uh, generally did it in a stock division in a relay uh, with Dave Daly. He was my partner. So we did a lot of 12-foot um, paddleboarding and training on Maui was... There wasn't a ton of us, but we had a really fun, tight-knit crew. And so I, there was a time um, I put a lot of time and effort into paddle boarding. And, um, you know, I've got the neck trouble now to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> that is a hard part of it, having done it's a little bit. It's one of the more uncivilized water <laughs> sports. <laughs> but it taught me so much about how wind swell and, and hole design and all these other facets that uh, even today with the foiling have become a very valuable source of information. Yeah, I think that's probably the thing I love the most is being more in touch with the water, not just your, that your arms are in it, but you felt every bump and you could get such a better feel for what, and then you can translate that to whether you're sitting or standing or doing some other paddling sport. Um, well, through Jerry and Laird, I got into it and being the surfers that they were, it we all kind of did it during the summertime as a means to be more prepared for winter in surfing. And so in paddleboarding, when you learn to use literally every bump in the water, you can translate that to using every bump when you're surfing or to catching a wave. And so it paid real dividends, not only for the physical um, benefits of being in shape and stronger shoulders and whatnot, but being able to read the water and use absolutely every little bump in the water to help you catch a wave. And so um, it wasn't just purely a fitness thing or summertime. It, it, almost everything we ever did always related back to the surf somehow 
and offered some benefit to doing it in the summertime. Yeah. So through the years and all these different sports, you've found new ways to enjoy. Well, again, you haven't just been um, on Maui, but over 30 years. And uh, somebody just mentioned you're a skier too. I know you have some mammoth and some California roots too. So yeah, every I went to high school in mammoth and, and really chased ski racing for, for uh, several years, but it didn't work out. Uh, I always tell people if I ever really was that good, I'd probably still be doing it, um, but I wasn't. So I tucked tail and run to Maui, and it was probably one of the best decisions I ever made. <laughs> and I know you have a beautiful wife and kids there, and uh, I assume you met her there. I guess I don't know that, but. <laughs> yep. She yeah. and I met her on Maui. We've got uh, two wonderful children. I've got two from a previous marriage, and uh, life is good. I've got no complaints. That's awesome. Well, we're, we're lucky to have you and to hear all about this. So we've got all the water sports and you actually um, actively enjoying them, but you're also an amazing competitor. And, um, you know, you're, you've got such a quiet, humble nature, but um, a lot of us, I think, have that inside drive. And you've competed and you've been a champion in a lot of things. I mean, talk about stand up and early races and what kind of racing you like. Sup racing. Um, well, yeah, early downwind racing was kind of my thing because it, again it felt the closest to surfing with it not actually being surfing so catching these open ocean swells on these really long boards um related to everything i knew from riding the wave and a lot of the skills that you learn in the waves can be applied in downwind stand-up um so yeah i was really into it which led to competing and um yeah, I love competing. God, I had some great races with Connor. Um, Ecolu, my cousin, and I did the channel race as a relay team for a few years together, and that was a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, just, God, being out in the open ocean and riding a board, competing up against, you know, the best in the world, there was nothing better. Um, and the training, actually. I mean, the race was really fun. And when you cross a channel like Molokai to Oahu, Kayibi Channel, um, regardless of where you finish, you really feel like you did something significant. Um, and so while, yeah, everybody was doing the best they can, it was more a self-accomplishment just by getting there. Uh, it's not an easy race, and it just gets harder and harder the further in. Uh, and it's kind of capped off with an upwinder for about a mile, mile and a half, which is really quite cruel, given how many <laughs> miles you just paddled to get there. Um, so, yeah, it's it was an incredibly fun race. But uh, I had always wished that the Maui to Molokai race had garnished more um, kind of notoriety because that actually is a really fun race. That one's 26 miles. Uh, as opposed to the 32 and the Molokai. And it just keeps getting better and better the, the further into the race you get. And um, probably, well, not probably, for sure, your highest average times would have come out of that channel as opposed to Kaiwi. Yeah, well, not to take anything away from M to O, and I have done that as a relay, and I can relate to all that you say about it. But M to M, is, I have heard the same thing, and you have lived it, is and I think this is the year races are coming back. Isn't July the month that we should be in Hawaii doing downwinders? And I believe they're still, I hope they're still going to hold both. Um, but M to M is on my bucket list for sure as something to do because everybody talks about how it's more lined up. And um, yeah, just a really super fun downwind. So, Well, I mean, the, the, the tradition and the prestige of the Molokai is, is going nowhere. It's always going to be there. It's the channel of channels, right? And, and if you want to be considered a legitimate channel racer, um, you've got to do well in that race. So there's no doubt about that. But if they can back up the Maui Molokai race somewhere in proximity, um, time-wise, boy, it sure makes a lot of fun to come to Maui or Hawaii yeah. and, and do race after race and just have a ball. Yeah, I don't know the dates, but I know that Connor had said before the pandemic there's going to be a like a Hawaii month where you should come here and do a whole bunch of races and they'll be back to back um, yeah. or, or, you know, choose a couple, which is great. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. 
And, so you uh, talk, you know, that last part of M to O. Um, I don't, have you done it yet um, on a foil? Let's go back to foiling. The first time when I did it as a relay, it was the first year I think there was foiling in it. And I thought a boat was whizzing by me and it was someone on a foil board just flying. And it was so cool um, to realize how much faster you guys, I forget what the record is, but you know, is it two hours faster that they get across the channel? You know, I don't know what the time is. I know yeah. for sure the speeds would be higher and, and the time less than a normal stand-up. There's no, you, I mean, you can't even compare the two. They're, they're right. completely it's, different craft. It's, it's like trying to compare a sailboat to a motorboat. You know, yeah, they're both boats, but they're different, right? And so the reason I will probably never do the Molokai to Oahu on a foil board is they haven't changed where the finish line is yet. And the thought of paddling for a mile and a half directly into the wind on a on a foil board makes zero sense to me. I don't even know how you do it. Do you have to lay down and paddle prone? That's, I mean, if I did it, yeah, that's how I would do it is lay down. <laughs> but if they move the finish line out to China Wall, I would seriously consider it and probably do it. Um, but until that point, you probably won't see me in that race. It, that's just too brutal of an end. Because <laughs> you're just... Just too wise, a little too smart at this stage in the game. Well, too wise or self-preservation, I don't have that capability to be competitive if I'm not on foil. If I'm on foil, I can, I can be competitive. You know, I probably pose no threat to Kai or some of the, you know, the Spencer kids. But uh, as long as I'm up on foil, yeah, I, I can mix it up with, with most of the good guys. But as soon as it becomes a paddling race, uh, I can't compete. Uh, but everybody would love to see you there. And uh, speaking of that, I didn't get to see you, but you were up in the gorge and they had, uh, I believe that was the first time they had to foil two different types of racing um, with and without a paddle and the Spencer brothers and the lot that you mentioned, you and Austin, I think were there too. Yep. Uh, and that was really fun to watch, including the um, wing division, which was new to me. The Spencer brothers, I don't, I think you were in that one. So I don't know if you saw the finish. They came in together and one of them, blocked the other one's wind, which is a windsurfing <laughs> thing. And, and they were explaining it over the, and I was like, oh, this is wild and very interesting to watch. So um, it's really fun, the the offshoots, the new types of, uh, to watch and see all of that coming through. Um, thoughts about where that will go, the different divisions of foiling, using foil in different ways with a board. I mean, they're not really all stand up, but they're interrelated. Yeah, I mean, the winging is more closely related to sailing. So I would imagine the sailing or windsurfing um, will try and steer where that goes. Um, I, don't, I mean, while as cool as it sounds, the thought of being in the water with six to 10 other guys going as fast as they possibly can with chainsaws connected to the bottom of their board scares the bejesus out of me. Yeah. So you're probably not gonna see me in those races. <laughs> <laughs> the downwind race, like you mentioned in Hood River, um, I did get to see some of that race, but only from the start because I was the last one off the line. I couldn't get up on my foil. So I saw everyone start. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a bit frustrating, but at this point, you know, I was, I had very, oh, managed expectations, let's say. And uh, just being there is fun. I have a ball when I go up there. and It's such a good vibe. Um, but yeah, I sure would like to do better next year. I, I, as you do, you make bad decisions. And I chose too small of a foil, so I couldn't get up. And I spent a better the part of the race just, just trying to get off the starting line. So that was frustrating. But I love that race. Uh, I love where they're going with it. And I look forward to going next year. And yeah, hopefully start when everybody else starts. Such a unique place and cool town. I always enjoy going up there so much. Absolutely. Let's go back to, you know, humble as you are, I don't know how much we're going to get out of you, but you really are an innovator and you're a board shaper. So talk about in stand up, both the, the racing, you were talking about like if you're going to downwind, you had to go to a bigger board and come up with us and all the way through foiling, which you um, have a company. And, you know, tell us about brands you've worked with and are working with and um, what well, you've done on your own. So I do have my own brand going, Kalama Performance. It, it probably skews way more towards foiling, but I do have stand-up boards for riding waves. 
and uh, longboards too. So I'm really stoked about where that's going and the opportunity it's providing. Um, more closely related to stand up and a company I've worked with before is Imagine. Um, so I'm back on board with Imagine. We've got right. new ownership. A lot of the same members of the band, let's say, are still making the music uh, with a couple new members. So yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. We're, we're a little more focused on what we feel is the most pertinent kind of section of foiling, and that is the recreational having fun, exercise, put the dog, cooler, fishing, whatever it is, just really trying to maximize a certain level of enjoyment, a high level of enjoyment on on the water and making it accessible and easy to everyone. So my designing for that isn't really the high-end racing or high-end wave performance, but more just making stand-up sort of what it was in the beginning. Just easy to jump on a board, user friendly and having fun and and that's really what uh the focus is and what all the team guys are are trying to work towards and and while racing and high end competitiveness of stand up may have waned a little bit um I think you probably know better than anybody participation is still very high in stand up and it's still a very maybe the most viable water sport mm-hmm. And so tapping into that and making sure that that thrives and is healthy and is a important part of stand up is uh, very much a focus for me right now. Great. And that is the most important part of the whole pyramid. You know, we had just ex exponential growth through about 2017. And I think people got, you know, we lost some companies and people thought it was over. It's not over just it's because the over. growth line goes from here to here. Yes. But we had another explosion with everything outdoors during the pandemic, oddly. Exactly. But, you know, it was, it was a surprise to a lot of people. But people found the outdoors. We have all kinds of new people, maybe on their inflatables. Maybe they didn't get super high-end equipment. But they're falling in love with it. And then they will need, you know, what you're making it imagine, SUP and Kalama Performance. So that 90% is recreational and is just having fun. And there's so many ways to enjoy the water on a stand-up. We talk about that all the time. You mentioned fishing and all those different things. But if for those of us who love the pointy end of the pyramid, whether it's <laughs> racing or foiling or whatever's the newest thing and winging, you need to keep growing it from the base. And we do have this really accessible water sport that at some level, maybe they won't do all those things at the top, but anybody can do it with the right instruction, with the right equipment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so that, that's the focus. I mean, riding a wave on a sup is is it's part of my dna now that's not going away i still do it all the time um there was, there was probably a good couple of years where foiling just dominated everything for me but because it took me away from stand-up and even longboarding um i have kind of fallen back in love with them and i am having as much or more fun than i've ever had on my longboard and my sub and kind of really reminded myself of the beauty um of why stand-up was so attractive and why it was so fun in the beginning. And so my boards are a little bit longer, a um, little bit narrower, and kind of back to what they were in the beginning. And just having a ball, just really enjoying it. And um, yeah, I'm getting to that certain age where the experience of what we're doing is so valuable to my physical well-being, but probably more so my mental well-being and understanding that I won't be able to do this forever. So I'm really going to enjoy it right now and make the absolute most of it. And so things that I might have overlooked um, are not getting overlooked anymore. I'm, I'm truly enjoying every aspect of it, the social, the purity and the simplicity of riding a wave. Um, you know, I don't, have to go out and rip every time to have a good time just being out there i'm like stoked so yeah i'm i'm, I'm enjoying stand up as much as i ever have right now great great love hearing that and um i think a lot of people are and you know there were definitely some naysayers right before the pandemic and at the beginning because they're you know they're like any industry there's struggles you know and from the industry side and also participation side but we still I believe we're still the fastest growing water sport and it'll be really interesting to see statistics from this year that's just finishing up that um, people really were able to find the outdoors and um, water sports was a big part of that. And I think stand up 
really huge. But keep talking about innovating. And um, I know you've worked with other companies too, and you've uh, had companies sponsor you that we know well, like QuickBlade. We just had Jimmy on a couple weeks ago, one of your buddies. Yep. In fact, we were talking about a something I think maybe you haven't done before that you might be doing coming up or they're trying to make you the fourth member of that team. <laughs> Don't you start on in I'm on the too. <laughs> I just had a very long conversation with Chris and Jimmy yesterday. And while I would absolutely love to do that race and know how much fun it would be, I also know from my past experience how seriously you have to take something of that nature and how much uh, time I'd have to dedicate towards the preparation. And between my own company and Imagine and, and still doing some private coaching and, and guiding, um, I'm not sure I have the time that I need in order to dedicate because I don't want to show up you know, kind of half cocked and, and think I can fake my way through it with, with a race. It's going to take two days. You can't fake that. You got to be prepared. So I don't know. Chris Parker says you can fake it. <laughs> We're all a little older now and wiser. huh? <laughs> exactly. Um, but along those lines, and you do have so much going on. Um, one of the things that people have loved and I have never had the opportunity to go on one are your Kalama camps. And yep. you are, I mean, you're a great instructor. I have had, uh, I think the NAC probably eight years ago, I think I took a workshop from you. Um, mm -hmm. So I know you're a great teacher and guide it, but those just sound like a blast besides being a learning opportunity. Are you still having those or tell me the history of those? Yeah, so my camps down in Namotu, Fiji, um, they kind of do themselves. I just have to not screw it up. <laughs> just being in Fiji is amazing. And the coaches I have with Colin McPhillips, Tom Carroll, Rory wow. Chapman from Australia, Michelle, who's kind of my right-hand man, manages everything, wouldn't be able to do it without her. Um, and myself, it, I mean, it's so fun just hanging out with those guys and then sharing that passion and the fun of Namotu um, is – amazing it i mean fiji namotu does most of the work we just gotta you know put the boards in the boat kind of pick out what wave to go for and, and it's truly a ball i mean it's truly a lot a lot a lot of fun so yeah i, I really enjoy doing that always look forward to being in fiji the people down there are amazing um what time of the year do you do that? And do you do a few back to back? I'm sure they're super popular. Are they filled up already for this year? Uh, no, I think we have some spaces. We we had to cancel 2021 because mm -hmm. uh, Fiji wasn't open it. And they, they literally just opened. And I just got back from the first week they were sort of open. Uh, had an opportunity to go down and, and never going to say no to a Fiji trip. So it was amazing as usual. Um, the Motu's getting going again, Tabarua too. Uh, first week of November, third week of November is when my camps are. And if you can make one of my camps, great. Even if you can't, go there anytime you can. Trust me, you will not be sorry. Never been and definitely another thing on my list. <laughs> yeah, it's worth putting on. Great. So you, list. <laughs> yeah, and then you mentioned... Um, you do private coaching, which I didn't know, but uh, would make sense on Maui, I assume. And how would people find you through Kalama Performance or just through like your Instagram here? Or uh, your probably KalamaPerformance.com. Uh, I don't do a lot of it. I, I am quite busy. Um, and I haven't done a lot over the pandemic, very little. But uh, I did one not too long ago, like just a couple of weeks ago and really enjoyed it and, and kind of remembered wow, I do really like teaching. So yeah, I'm available for private coaching um, of canoe paddling, stand up paddling and foiling for that matter. Um, but I, I don't want to overdo it because I've got so many other things going on, but I do really enjoy trying to help someone crack the code on what they're doing and, and get further down the road. And, you know, for me, it's there's the mechanical side of any given sport but there's the implementation which i think is just as important and the mindset that goes with it uh, and I, when i say mindset i don't mean just competitive mindset just how to maximize your enjoyment set expectation levels and how to integrate the mechanics 
so they're most effective. Um, so there's a lot more to it than just the mechanics of, of put your arm here and pull back in this direction type stuff. Um, but yeah, I really enjoy that and, and get a buzz off of other people's stoke. That's awesome. And I, I can't imagine how fun that would be and how, I mean, who would be a better instructor than Dave Kalama? Um, <laughs> uh oh, now you're going to get too busy. <laughs> so you, um, you have worked with Imagine. Um, you have your own foil. Do you have your own foil company too? Is that yours? No, foiling, the foils themselves, the hydrofoils, I use GoFoil. Mm -hmm. uh, been, so the driving force behind GoFoil is Alex Aguera, who has been a very close friend of mine since the mid 80s ish, late 80s. Um, when I first did a proper year on the World Cup tour in windsurfing, Al, Alex kind of took me under his wing and really helped guide me through Europe. I was lost and hopeless. <laughs> and uh, it didn't take me long to figure out that racing wasn't my thing. So I didn't stay on tour very long. And I, I realized Maui's where I want to be and riding waves is what I do. And so uh, that was really the focal point of all my windsurfing career. Um, but yeah, Alex uh, Aguera, who is Mr. Gofoil, has been a friend for a long time. So uh, supporting what he does and, and collaborating with testing equipment and whatnot and helping to do a little promotion here and there. So uh, yeah, check out great. GoFoil. So, <laughs> GoFoil, I thought it was your company for some reason, so, but no. you've been a great uh, representative. I'm sure um, your input has made a huge difference too. So um, what is on the docket and is it, uh, it's winter here? Does that mean big waves? Are we still searching for those, waiting for that? Biggish waves, not, <laughs> Ish, not the same I like size I used to ride. <laughs> um, yeah, no more, no more days out of Piahi. At least not me riding the waves, but occasionally my son will get me out there, um, towing them in or back up. Um, but I still really like to wave, ride waves myself, so I don't say yes every time he asks me to go up there. Because I still like going to the outer reefs and, and riding, as I say, big-ish waves, but not like Piahi big. Um, so, yeah, still really enjoy being in the water almost on a daily basis. Um, either stand up, longboarding, or foiling. Um, downwinding as much as I possibly can when the surf's good paddling to the outer reefs with a couple friends and enjoying that. And uh, yeah, it's, while my priorities have changed, the amount of time I spend in the water has actually changed very little. And uh, I couldn't be more thankful for that than I am. Yeah, great. Gratitude for water, that's for sure. We are addicted. So maybe, let's see, you could give us a few tips maybe. So maybe three tips for somebody who wants to start foiling. Cause that's one of, uh, that's still new to a lot of us. Haven't tried yep. it yet. Well, if you, if, if you want to get into foiling, um, come in with what is most comfortable for you. If, if you're a normal surfer and, and laying down on a board is very comfortable for you, then prone foiling would be the way to go. Uh, I would recommend a big board, a big foil so that you can ride really small waves because things happen really quick. And, and the smaller the wave, the slower everything happens. But even backing up one more step, let's say you, you're more comfortable on a stand-up. A big stand-up, a big foil, and the best way to start is behind a boat where you can try and minimize the variables as much as possible. Um, you want to start real slow, just learn how to, coming up is easy. <laughs> it's the going back down is where the control comes from. All you got to do is lean back. That board's coming up out of the water. So the trick really becomes how to keep it down from coming completely out of the water and then crashing. Uh, so start behind a boat. Use the largest equipment you can get because that allows you to go much slower and, and try and manage things because they're going to seem like it's happening really fast. Um, and then the other thing that I really like to recommend to people is don't stick around to see how it ends. And by <laughs> that, I mean, 
if you feel like you're losing control, bail as quick as you can. Because the only time you're going to get yourself in trouble or hurt is when you try and recover. And as a surfer, it's, it's, a, it's second nature to try and recover from anything. In foiling, that will get you hurt. So you really have to kind of set that mentality to the side. And the minute it feels like it's getting away from you, kick it out from under you, get the foil away from you, you eliminate the danger, and now you're just falling in the water. So that would probably be the most valuable piece of information yeah. I could give to anybody that's thinking about learning. Um, but I can tell you this, it's not easy, but it is absolutely the most worth going through the suffering to get to the fun part of anything I've ever done. It's amazing. I mean, if, you, if anybody, if you've seen Back to the Future and the Flying Skateboard, it <laughs> yeah. feels like that for real. <laughs> you feel like you're flying. And, and wow. in essence, you are. You know, you're above the water. There's no spray coming off your board. And you just, well, when you get control, it feels like you're just surfing this pillow or cloud, you know? And that's, so, yeah. It's so wild to me because I love uh, nature-powered whatever it is, which is, you know, not. I'm not against motors, but the idea that you would be flying without a motor is, yeah. is way cool. I mean, it's still a gravity sport, similar to skiing, skateboarding, snowboarding, surfing, all the rest. Mm -hmm. But the reduction of friction means you can reduce the angles that you need in order to get going and moving forward. Mm. So you hardly need anything to get the board up to speed and to continue riding. And, you know, I probably ride waves that aren't breaking more of the time than I ride waves that are breaking. And which is one of the beauties um, and which makes the foiling or uh, I should say the downwind foiling really fun. Once you get to that point, don't, don't, don't start foiling and downwinding. <laughs> start in the waves, start behind the, boat. start behind the boat, move to the waves, learn all the fundamental skills you'll need and then move on to downwinding if, if you're inclined to. But if you do get to the downwinding, uh, I can tell you it's, it's almost like starting over again. It's tricky. Reading the water, placement um, is all, even though you have tons of experience maybe downwinding on a SUP board, it's like starting over again on a foil um, because you're really in different parts and the playing field is so much larger that what you need to scan and, and make decisions for is, is much larger. But it's, uh, you know, it's like playing a game of chess with yourself. And when you get your decisions right, it means you get to keep gliding and keep having fun and sometimes going really fast. Um, so it, it's, yeah, it's amazing. Cool. What a great description of it. Yeah, that, that was a good sell. And also, I think the biggest hurdle for a lot of us is looking at the safety of it and seeing that big shiny piece of metal at the bottom. So you're that third, but most important tip that you just gave us about getting away from it. And that's really yep. interesting that surfers, I hadn't really thought about that, that you usually are trying to correct and stay with it, but instead you have to get away from it. Yeah. I, I surf at Santa where a lot of people over the last, you know, five, eight years have been learning how to foil. And so we've always been, ah, you know, stay away from the beginners, but, um, you know. And that's a justifiable concern. It's a foil <laughs> border learning, you know, it is a dangerous situation to be around. So <laughs> give them a little extra room or tell them to go down the beach. Well, and to your point about not needing the wave to break, they are able to go, you know, Santa, so a little bit farther down away from the breaking waves and use just the power of those, uh, yeah. the undulating ocean and the power that she has is uh, amazing that those who learn how to use it and can turn around well, and take another bump. The, the wing, wing ding or hand wing, kite wing, whatever you want to call it, um, is a great tool to get into foiling too, because what it, what it does is it offers a counterbalance mm. um, for you rather than like a tight rope where you're just balancing yourself. You actually can kind of use the wing to counter as a counter force to stabilize yourself and, and use it as a balancing apparatus. Um, so it's a great means to go out and downwind a little bit and start to figure out what's going on out there and getting up isn't an issue because the wing's fairly easy to get up on. So, uh, winging is, is a great vehicle to spend time up on the foil, which you learn the basics and the fundamentals of how to fly. And then you can use it in the waves. You can use it downwinding. So it's a, it's a great device to 
propel yourself through the different uh, stages and, and facets of foiling. Yeah. Somebody just said they're going off to wing right now, in Ventura, Derek and Ventura. <laughs> and lots cool. of people thanking you for your great advice. So um, you have been so many places and you travel. Are there still um, any plans, things you haven't done yet? I can't think of any paddling type things you haven't done yet, uh, but maybe places you haven't been. Um, one of the few places I haven't been is New Zealand. And from all the movies and the people I meet, um, seems like such a wonderful place that I'd love yeah. to go explore there. The water's a little cold, so I'm not super excited about getting in the water, but I've heard <laughs> the quality of the waves are really good. So that kind of offsets the cold water. Um, but yeah, maybe when things calm down with COVID and, and all the restrictions and this and that, um, maybe get down there someday. But other than that, Boy, the place I love to go and visit the most is Maui. <laughs> and my it is an beaches. amazing place. Yeah. And I know um, the COVID's been really hard for the Hawaiian Islands. Islands are small. Islands are, you know, you can't move around and you have a history yep. of, you know, a past history of disease, you know, really devastating islands and such. So I know there's such mixed feelings about it opening it up, but you're also such a huge tourist destination that it's just really crushed a lot of people's jobs and stuff so yeah the economic ramifications were significant there's mm -hmm. no denying that but um i was one of the lucky ones that isn't directly relying on the tourist industry so when it did shut down it felt very much like going back to the 80s when i first got here and no traffic on the roads no crowds on the beach the water even seemed to kind of clear up and the, there were more fish on the reef and uh there were some some kind of silver lining silver linings i guess yeah. you say to the whole experience but um yeah it, it was a pretty steep price to pay so mm -hmm. I, i'm not sure anybody really wants to see that again but uh i appreciated that little slice of time and getting to kind of go back to the 80s for a moment i did hear that that it was amazingly quiet and peaceful and you know no traffic yeah. and in in the waves or on the roads both so that that part yeah had to be absolutely fantastic. So anything else, um, where are you traveling to next? You home for a while? You just said your favorite place is Maui, you're, you're back. Um, yeah, right now I don't have, a, I don't have any travel itinerary. Um, might do a trip to Columbia for Imagine or to Florida too. We might stop into Florida and do some stand up paddling um, representing Imagine, so. Great. But that's not till like February. So between here and there, making boards and riding them. There you go. Great stuff. Somebody yeah. asked about Nazare. Have you uh, surfed there? No, Portugal? I haven't. It looks inc uh, it looks. Are those crazy. pictures wild? <laughs> wild. Um, there's absolutely no question that is the tallest wave in the world, and. Having not taken a beating there, I, I don't know if it's the worst beatings in the world because some of the other <laughs> waves I think can compete on that level. But in terms of pure height, it, it's it's crazy. It's cartoonish, you know. So yeah. what the guys are doing out there is amazing to see and fun to watch. And uh, I just hope everyone continues to make it home like most of them have for, you know, knock on wood. Yeah. Um, yeah, but the, the flotation, I think, is such a key part of that. And uh, thankful that came along and, yeah. and has become a standard piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. So I think as long as, as that's there and every indication it will be, um, I look forward to watching what all the big wave paddle in, towing and, and seeing the bar keep getting raised um, from where we got it to. Yeah. Along those lines, you know, safety, you've actually really been helpful, I think, in the SUP industry. Um, I think you are made a sticker or you endorsed it or handed it out that said, um, leashes save lives. Uh, Warren which... Curry up in Edmonton. Oh, yeah. Or Easy Rider Warren. Um, he made it. Who's a good friend of mine. So, yeah, absolutely endorsed it. Um, I, I, I don't remember for sure, but there was the, the young man that lost his life up in Hood River. And he did yeah, have on, a leash. Um, it was an Andre, uh, ah, 
yes. horrible. I can't remember his name. Yeah, super great guy from Florida. Yeah. So I think that motivated a lot of people in the industry to kind of recognize how valuable leases were. And um, having close calls myself doing Maliko runs, um, I've always, always got a leash on now when I'm in the open ocean. And that wasn't necessarily true in the early days. Um, yeah. Ego was very much a part of my bad decision making. Um, and I'm fortunate that I never went through any really bad experiences because I've heard of them and it does happen. Mm -hmm. But a leash eliminates that. Yeah. And so if you're not wearing a leash in the open ocean or even in Hood River, you don't even have to be in the open ocean. Um, oh, it's Andres Pombo was his name. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was a very sad situation. Yeah, and I think um, we've talked about it before in our sport, any sport, you kind of adopt what's already there. Yep. And for whatever reason, in 2008, there was an Oregon, in, anyway, they decided that we're a vessel, a stand-up paddleboard. They didn't know where to put us, so they put us in the kayak category. So we automatically got that safety equipment. And not that it was bad, but it wasn't, I still think there's lots of innovation to be had in safety equipment because the leashes came from surfing and the life jackets. Now, you know, we do have the inflatable. Yeah. And like you said, even in surfing, they finally admitted that in big waves having the, having that, you know. Yeah. I mean, in 99.9% .9 of any risky situation, a leash is a benefit to have. There are a couple in rivers or right. fast moving flowing water. They can be dangerous. Or they just have to be the right type, most yes. importantly. You, you got to have Quick access release. to unclip it should you need to, mm -hmm. because your board going on one side, you on the other can create a, a significant risk. But if you can unclip, you eliminate the risk and, and situation resolve. So I'm a big proponent of leashes. Um, absolutely. Well, thank you. And I think you did a lot to help people recognize um, the importance. So um, especially because this is still a young sport and we still have that recreational level, new people coming in all the time. Um, I'm personally always blown away that there are people who don't swim who stand up paddleboard because I think you should be able to swim, but um, just any water sport, it's wild to me that you would feel comfortable. I think a lot of that though is just not having enough knowledge and respect of water. As much as I love water, it is to be respected and uh, you should know how to work with it whether you're in it or on it, <laughs> all the way around. Oh, you've got some people listening from, uh, is it Edmonton, where Warren's from, saying hi? Oh, cool. And Chris Parker says he'll see you in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not helping, am I? <laughs> no, you're not helping. <laughs> you're helping Chris, you're not helping me. <laughs> yeah, he's my new buddy. I'm glad he's back because as yeah. someone who's still super involved and loves stand-up paddle racing, I'm super happy. We Somebody asked me here, uh, I think it was uh, Matthew from Total Sup, when I'm going to start foiling. I am actually going into the hospital at 9.30 tomorrow morning to get a new hip, so it won't be for a while. <laughs> My age is cat. You're much younger than me. Is catching up with me. So, um, but it's I'm going to be as good as new. Hopefully by January, February, and back to still getting the exhilaration of learning new well, things. Good Just, luck with the hip surgery. Thank you very much. They really have uh, done a great job with you know improvements. Like many things we've talked about, yep. it's it's outpatient surgery. I'm home by the afternoon. Crazy, huh? It's crazy. With a it's card crazy. that says I'm going to set off metal detectors for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah kind of cool so um like any last words about um water paddling surfing wind i always see those as kind of we are such an interesting overlap of all of those in stand-up um and you've again i can't think of a craft you haven't yeah. been on or in you know i mean we what you do is a little bit irrelevant um if you enjoy it right? Foil, stand up, surf, what, what, wind surf, whatever it is. If you, if you get that level of enjoyment that it makes you happy, that, that's a great thing. So I could care less what sport you do as long as you're doing something, right? And to share a little bit of my experience over the last couple of years, um, n no one has enjoyed surfing more than me. I'm sure a lot of people have enjoyed it as much. But
I never, never had close to a, a, the level of appreciation I should have for how important it was to my mental health. Mm. And having gone through that and watching the news too much, like probably a lot of us did, and, and you, you go into those negative spirals. But within the first minute of being in the water, it's like, oh, you know what? The world's okay. We're going to be all right. Everything is fine. And by the time you get out of the water, you're in a good mood and you can kind of deal with everything. And so, yes, do a sport. But the benefit from that sport isn't always how good you get at it. It's how it makes you feel and how you interact with the world after mm -hmm. you've done it is as important as anything and creating a smile from any one of those given sports. Um, I've learned to truly appreciate that as, as yeah. much as any aspect of any sport I do. Ah, beautifully said and so true. And I do think a lot of us are more cognizant of it now. And you had all kinds of people agreeing um, below. Also Elo says, hi, he just jumped on there, Eric Logan. Right on, Elo. On the call. We're just wrapping up, Elo, but it'd be good to see you again. Thanks. I'm honored, but I'm That's very honored. That's the guy always takes smile. I know yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm most honored, Dave, though, that you would come. I know you get um, in magazines. I've read all kinds of great interviews from, you know, the big stuff outside and, you know, the ones that are, and everybody knows your name. So um, that you would come and talk to little old Kristen Thomas and stand up paddling is a, uh, is really a, a joy, like you said. These things make me happy, and it's all about that. Um, I will ask one more really specific question if I can find it here. People really want to know, like, what's your favorite Danwin wing foil setup and some uh, size, mass type, mass type. Okay, so <laughs> foiling downwinding, I use a 27 inch mast, which is kind of a shorter one. Mm -hmm. I find there's less drag. I ride kind of low most of the time so I don't need a real long one a shorter shorter mass makes it easier to get up uh, it's faster I think overall as long as you don't have over foiling problems my bread and butter wing is a GT 1250 um, and when it's really windy uh, I go to the RS 1150 I believe I get I, all those numbers just become too much. <laughs> but uh, and then I'm using the 14 inch fixed long tail is kind of my bread and butter for downwinding, wave riding. Uh, occasionally, I'll show I'll throw the short 14 tail on. Uh, I don't want to get too into the weeds and technical. With no, but that's really up. interesting. I didn't even know the term. So the mast is this part and then the yep. wing going out to the sides. OK. Exactly. Didn't even know the terminology. Um, I, I thought mask was, you know, windsurfing again, going up. <laughs> it's going down too. That makes sense. It's, it's, it's the same orientation, but under the water instead of above the water. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yep. So um, water is my best therapy. People are just totally agreeing about the, the mental health thing still. And I think that's just such um, the joy from it and what it brings us um, on so many levels is is so key and what you have done for stand-up paddleboarding and other sports but specifically i thank you for what you have done since 95 wow <laughs> for stand-up paddleboarding but especially in the last maybe 15 years where um, you've just stayed so involved been so approachable and so nice and fun you're just such a good guy um, thank you and thank <laughs> you for the conversation Obviously, you know, this isn't our first fun conversation. We run into each other at all the trade shows and other fun functions. So it's always a pleasure to see you and have the conversations we yeah. do. Next, and, uh, next time, hopefully in person with a beer. <laughs> yes, that'd be nice. <laughs> Ready for that. Well, just want to remind everybody that this was live and it gets recorded. So immediately it goes to IGTV on SubConnect. And then by in a couple of days, it will be on YouTube for SubConnect and also on KT Outside, which is my YouTube channel. Um, what a great interview. So many great ideas, thoughts. Uh, I, two people said they're gonna be quoting you. <laughs> um, and tips for foiling and other things. Um, you have such an amazing outlook on life, Dave Kalama. Thank you. Thank you, Enjoyed. Christian.
enjoyed the hour with you. Pleasure talking with you. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.